Welcome to the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling. You are about to discover impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you, so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Be sure you visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now tune in, get ready, and enjoy the journey of emerging as a leader of exception in the 21st century. Welcome everyone to the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Vicki Nethling, and I'm coming from Roswell, Georgia. The goal of our podcast is to empower our guest with topics that will make you grow your business as a confident leader, and you will also grow individually as a confident leader. Today, my guest is Matt Boyle, and let me tell you a little bit about Matt. Matt is a sales system master. We'll have to ask what that means. A 2016 trip to Thailand changed everything when he made the commitment to prevent poverty-driven exploitation through job creation. Today, Matt helps B2B businesses generate more leads and improve sales conversions by employing employment hubs in developing countries. The theme for today is making an impact while making a profit. Who doesn't love that? Please join me in welcoming my guest, Matt Boyle. Hey, Matt. How are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, I just am very interested to hear all about this. And uh, you had a a very intriguing bio there um, because a lot of people don't think of that big of a goal. And that's a big goal. That is a big goal. It, it is. It's, it's one of those things that never started as a big goal. It, it just one of those things that grew, it grew on me. Mm-hmm. And when I went, you know, when I went to Thailand and I had my heart opened up to what was happening over there and that I, I you know, I've got six kids of my own. And the, the whole time that I was over there, I was looking at my kids on the faces over there and my yeah. kids growing up. And, and when I was talking to the people, both of the, the the women that we'd rescued and the, the women that we couldn't rescue and just hearing their stories and all that stuff, it just opened up that place in the heart and it just went, I've got to do something about it. I can't, you know, I can't go back to life as it was before. So yeah. it just, just opened up and it's been all consuming for the last six years and it will be all consuming for, for, for probably at least the next six years, I'd hope. So what does social entrepreneurship mean and how is it tied to what you're doing? Well, there was an evolution when I, when I went to Thailand and when I got back that I wanted to make an impact. So I started off going, I want to grow my business to this point of excess so I can give the money to go make an impact. And there was kind of three competing forces as I was heading down that path that was kind of just just, just sitting there and not making that yeah. the, the ideal scenario that, you know, I was at the point that I was giving my mortgage money away. So my business was suffering because I was actually giving too much away and it wasn't sustainable. But then I was also looking at it from, from my perspective and going, well, if I was in that situation, I wouldn't just want someone to donate money to me. I, I would actually want someone to give me an opportunity mm-hmm. to pick myself up. And, and that's so how I kind of started thinking that maybe donating wasn't the, the ideal sort of use of that money. There was a better, there was fish. a better use of it. Yeah. And, teach them to fish, and, right? But yeah, it was, it was teach them to fish. And then I started, as I was looking at all these missionaries and all these um, not-for-profits that do mm-hmm. an amazing, you know, an amazing job, I looked at the kind of restrictions that they had, that they were relying on donations and, they're also running education and there's some, you know, great people that do some amazing things with these education programs and help microfinance, you know, these people into small businesses. Yeah. But these small businesses are operating in communities where there is no money. 
Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter how good you are at running the business. If there's no money in the community that you're working in, the business is never going to get that. So I, I kind of was sitting back and, and looking at it and going, well, how can I actually make a sustainable impact? And at the time mm. I was um, a sales trainer. So I had um, businesses all over Australia. We had four offices and we were training sales teams how to be more effective in mm. sales, especially over the internet and, and stuff like that. And there was this, this thing of going, I'm sitting in this boardroom training this group of salespeople. And I worked out that it was costing this business $25,000 for the day between my fees, the room hire and all this, the wages they're paying for the employees. And I knew that within 30 days, none of that, nothing that I taught them, those <laughs> people would be done because there was no accountability. Yeah. So on one, one hand, I've got this big problem over exists that there's no sustainable solution that I could see that's putting money into communities that need it and putting job opportunities in there. But then there's on this other hand, I'm running this business where there's a big gaping need because people are paying $25,000 for sales training, but none of that stuff's going. So I kind of went, well, if I can just combine the two together Mm. and build the systems that can, all the stuff that I was training businesses, if I could build the systems to automate it and outsource it, instead of businesses paying me to train their team for their team not to do the work, they can pay me to build the systems and then I can go build these employment hubs in these in these communities. So mm-hmm. the social entrepreneurism came when I decided to put people first and put making an impact as the core of what I do, that the, mm. everything is about creating jobs and creating these employment hubs and you know, being able to use job creation to put money into the community, to put education into the, you know, in, into the people to be able to give, give them the, the chances to stand up, grow themselves and, and, you know, build this, build this life that doesn't revolve around exploitation and sexual slavery and, and all that kind of stuff. And the second I kind of did that and then overlaid that with a business framework of, here is a commercial product. So instead of going to businesses asking for donations, I can go to businesses that they don't need to be interested in my cause because I can go to them and say, you invest this money with us and we're going to give you a three to five times ROI. Mm. So, so now, you know, through this, this, this model, the more impact we have, the more profit we make and the more profit we make, the more impact we have. And that's, that's been the, the kind of evolution and how, you know, this social entrepreneurism in the framework that, that I, I use it has really been evolved and, and grown and sort of turned into this, this amazing model that I would never have considered mm-hmm. has, has, has given us the, you know, us the blessings and us the success personally mm-hmm. that, that, than what it has while being so fulfilling and rewarding by being able to sort of impact all these lives in, in these communities and stuff. Can you describe for me what the employment hub looks like, you know, feels like, explain more what that is for the audience. So in its sort of most simplistic point of view, it's an outsourcing center. So we, we have one office at the moment in Davao in the Philippines and we COVID has kind of slowed our plans down, but we're hoping over the next 12 months to be able to open our second center in, in, in Thailand. So effectively, it's just a, a, a typical kind of outsourcing center, you know, from the outside. But on the inside, everything that we kind of do is based around, you know, developing our team members, you know, growing them and actually impacting the community. So, you know, we, we through our center, we run um, meal programs and other sort of, you know, community impact you know, services Mm -hmm. that we run through, you know, we we run through that. As we continue to grow, we continue to add more of those services on and and look at more education and stuff. So, you know, that that creates the the jobs. We pay our staff really, really well. By by, by the local standards, we make sure they're all, you know, we're paying really well and given great conditions. So then they can take the the wages that they earn and go spend that in the community. Mm to be able to impact those that aren't, aren't necessarily working for us as well. That's good. That's good. 
So what's the difference between being a social entrepreneur and a regular old entrepreneur? <laughs> entrepreneur? Well, for me, and the, the, the evolution for me was I was building a business for myself and for my, you know, for, for my family. So I was looking at it from how can I get the most out of my business? How can I, yeah, how can I make the most amount of money um, and have the, have the best life for me? Then, you know, when I sort of shifted that where it's, it's now not about me, it's how can I make the biggest impact? How can I change? How can I change as many lives as possible and improve and improve that? So that's been, been the shift for me that it's gone from me focused to mission focused. Mm. Um, broader than that, I said, I don't, you know, I, I don't have opinions, other, you know, necessarily outside of kind of my, my world um on 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 that but there's so many different sort of forms of social entrepreneurism that are all sort of focused on making an impact to the environment making an impact to local communities mm -hmm. and improving people's life lives that i would sort of consider would sit into that same sort of mission focused mm -hmm. you know mi mi mission focused type of driver yeah i i found myself that the more i focused on helping others the happier i was and totally. so, and so when I retired, I just figured I'm just going to do, uh, you know, wherever I can help people, whether it's pushing people to resources that could help them or helping them myself. But as long as I was helping people, it makes me happy. Yeah, so I absolutely. Totally get, totally get what you're saying. So how did your experiences lead to you to this, um, becoming the CEO and founder of online to offline? O to O. So, so online to offline started long before Thailand, and it's evolved. It's evolved through there because what O to O sort of stood for, and online to offline is, was how can we take customers in the online world mm -hmm. and be able to convert them in the offline world, ah. and that was that was what way back in two thousand six, two thousand and seven is when I first started noticing the internet was changing how people were buying and that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that there was this, this shift that now is, is, is seismic, but back then was only subtle. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of one of the first people to go, well, there's something, this isn't going away. We've got to be able to leverage that. So I started to figure out how to be more effective over the internet, how to generate more leads mm -hmm. and then how to be able to convert them, you know, in the, in the real world mm -hmm. through from there. So that was that was where O2O started online to offline started. And then as I got back from Thailand and wanted to sort of make a difference, the the the, the business evolved from training people how to do it into a doing it for them and doing it with them type of model. So, you know, the the systems and the knowledge predated Thailand. We just decided to to apply them in a different framework mm -hmm. that enabled us to have more of that impact and sort of focus more on, you know, what, what was becoming more important, more important driver for me. Mm -hmm. So how big is your organization now? Is it still small or um, have you got a larger team? It's, it's, it's growing. We are, you know, we've got big goals over the next five years of how many centers we want to, we want to open. So I'm always looking at it from, you know, how far have we got to go before, we hit we hit our goals which we're still a long we're still a long way from 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 that but but our team's growing we've got a we've got a really great leadership team awesome. you know in our philippines office now and we've, we've been able to sort of build our build our agents quite mm -hmm. steadily over the last sort of couple of years we've been able to you know recruit a lot more train a lot more and the the thing that i sort of really love about the where we're going over there is we actually retain our team nice you know at, at a lot higher rate we, we have a very very low employee churn churn which is which is awesome yeah especially in the last two years <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so um the the model that you have is it completely repeatable or do you find that you tweak it from time to time well, we have that we, we have a framework and the framework that we, we use applies for any any business, whether you're selling a coaching consulting program, whether you're selling a, a B2B franchise, whether you're selling 
investment opportunities into franchise or trying to raise capital, the the framework remains mm-hmm. remains the same. Inside of that framework, there and each of those key steps, there's different levers that you can pull for different for, for different applications. So mm-hmm. the so when we work with businesses, every solution we implement is absolutely bespoke and built and integrated in within the within the the, the business framework. Mm-hmm. So you know we work work to do that, but we make all of that completely repeatable, completely trainable, and completely measurable because we overlay overlay those systems within that framework that we've we've developed. Yeah, that's great that you um, have the measurement in there because a lot of I think businesses fail because they get these great ideas but they don't figure out how to measure and. Uh, <laughs> no, and there's there's two you know th- th- there's two ways to measure. You can measure the lag indicators, so the results, or you can measure the lead indicators, which is the the activities. And we've mm-hmm. kind of been able to you know integrate a heap of different kind of management frameworks into this sort of mm-hmm. you know and kind of taking the 40x framework the um, in with a little bit of kind of what Edward Stemming mm-hmm. used to sort of talk about yeah, right. uh, about kind of improvement and. And stuff to be able to with every every campaign we run, every account we do, we have the activities, and so we want to measure the activities because the first reason why any campaign fails is because you're just not doing the work. Yeah. So we have we have all the you know complete accountability of you know how much time are we spending on each task, how, how many tasks we're getting done every day, and and all that stuff. But then there's the other side of it is what's the results of those activities. So we benchmark. All of those, all of those results, and if we're doing a say an outreach campaign, how many people have we contacted versus how many people have responded, and we want to be able to measure measure that on a daily basis. So, if we're doing the work but it's not delivering the result, we can go back and know where we need to pull some different levers, yeah. make some changes, and 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 do it. And that's that's where we have our campaign analysts that we've trained over there. That that's all they do is they look at those numbers every single day that benchmarking and they've sort of been able to go and they have the the framework of if something's behind but behind the eight ball and something we're, we're below benchmark mm. they're looking in and going right what can we do what can we what what can we adjust because there's so many moving parts in any yeah. campaign which you and because we take it from and we work with businesses from lead generation all the way through to sales conversion onboarding client retention you know there's so there's so many moving variables yeah that affect all affect all of that you only need one or two of them to be slightly off for the results to dip so we have our analysts that are looking at those that, those things daily making the course corrections mm-hmm. so even though even though a campaign can be off track for three quarters of the month because we've been making those course corrections we still end up where, where we need to be and still end up achieving achieving our goals Mm-hmm. through through having those eyes and that's 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 for, for us that's probably the most the biggest differentiation between what we do versus what say a lot of outsourcing centers or marketing agencies or sales coaches or business coaches that will kind of uh, to some overlap be a competitor of ours that's where i see our big differences and that that innovation came out of necessity that when yeah. you're training people that have no idea about sales, no idea about yeah. business, no idea about, you know, half of our team didn't even know how to turn a computer on when they worked for us. Yeah, so when you, you're taking them from, from that basis, we had to make sure our systems were robust enough that we could actually execute and deliver on what we promised. Sometimes it's more beneficial to train somebody who doesn't have preconceived notions and things, especially if they um, are willing to be a sponge. <laughs> I, I would I would sit there and say always I would much rather when back in my sales management days I'd much rather take someone that has never ever sold before mm-hmm. and train them in in our way and train them in our methodology than try to take someone that had learned bad habits or yeah. learned to le- learn a system that wasn't congruent with how we how we operated mm-hmm. and be able to sort of train train them through from that and yeah it always took a little bit longer to get them up to up to speed and get them up to sort of you know the performance levels yeah but they always outperformed yeah you know they always outperformed and the return on investment was always always better so you know we took that same approach with with our center over here and 
and through that and just the necessity of the the agents that were hiring and the communities were working in and sort of their their backgrounds mm -hmm. just meant that the systems we had to build had to be incredibly robust and i i used my kids as examples so i went well I, I need my eight-year-old kid to be able to understand this yeah and if i can get right. it if i can get it to, to that level then i know of then, then i know i've got it and you know that took a long time and you know there was there was huge consequences for us personally as we're going through that journey mm. but when we locked all of that when we locked all of that in and got you know got those systems right it just fell into place and went wow mm. and we've been able to grow quite consistently ever since is there a difference between what you do for offline people uh, and online uh, for, for getting leads or the, the the difference comes on where a business gets involved in the sales process. So these days, anyone that kind of goes, my customers don't start online, is is living in the past. Every buying <laughs> journey starts starts on the internet now. No, no matter what it is, whether you're looking for a coffee or whether you're looking to buy a house or anything in between, it starts yeah. it starts online, and then you know, the, the offline interaction is only part of the journey. So there's that, that, that real integration between the online world and the offline, offline world. So different businesses that we, we, you know, we work with and different clients, at what point do we need to in, inject an offline conversation mm -hmm. changes? In some cases, it's very early in the process and then we can leverage through systems and through people the the the, the follow-up steps right other businesses we can leverage the beginning of the conversations and inject them in in the end so that part is different just about for, for every client we we work with yeah um from there but again it sits in that framework that is supported by you know it's supported by systems around either side of it yeah and taking time to get to know your clients what their needs are to be able to best give them advice it, it, exactly, and you can do that through podcasting like this, and, and and interviews, and and social media, and you can do that through webinars, or you can do that through one-on-one -on -one conversations. Like there's so many mm -hmm. different ways to be right these days. The where I think a lot of people get caught up is they try to sort of become, you know, they get in that tunnel vision of this is how we yeah. do it, mm -hmm. and they, they they lose sight of of that. So you know, we spend a lot of time. With our clients in looking at the how to use the different technologies that are available to improve the quality of the relationship and and, and be able to kind of become more personal mm -hmm. and more personalized rather than become more automated and we then want to automate as much of it as we can and leverage it as much as we can mm -hmm. but we need to start from that place of how can we improve that authenticity of the communication the quality of the communication so though those that are, are coming through it and customers that are coming through it actually want to do business with you because you stand out from you stand out from the competition yeah. and you're doing more touch points more you know and more sort of authentic communication mm -hmm. rather than what people are sort of falling behind of let's just do a social media post and let's just do an email blast and let's just hope yeah. for the best and 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 that so that's that's kind of how you know how we sort of build our campaigns and build our philosophy you know in on the top level and then as we kind of work through the the, the levels there we start building in leverage you know through those you know multi multi-channel events and automation and outsourcing to be able mm -hmm. to allow us to do more of it but it has to start from that place of of authenticity and relationship first yeah as a career um <clears throat> I've been a project manager for a long time. And as a project manager, the best thing for my projects to go well is the time that I spend in the beginning asking question after question after question, you know, okay, what are you doing this? Why are you doing this? How likely is this to happen? Now tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> and you might think well, it's- It's, it's that saying projects don't, projects don't fail, people fail. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the more you understand about what's going on, you know, and we, we made plenty of mistakes and we've had clients that we didn't live up to expectations in the beginning. And, and that came down to that exact, the exact point there of, 
you know, we assumed we, we did our part right, mm-hmm. but we were missing part of the puzzle that, you know, we hadn't asked that was had nothing to do with the scope of work that we were doing, yeah. but ultimately affected the end result of the, the, the end result of the project. And because mm-hmm. we didn't go there in the, the beginning, the, you know, the clients that were working with the projects weren't as successful yeah. as they could be. So that's where, where now we take a very, you know, holistic approach and a very integrated approach and just go, go deep and, you know, it, it, we just have the, the philosophy, if this is too much for you, then let's just stop Yeah. now because it's I, a, I don't want a to put, relationship, right? Well, it's, it's that thing. I don't want to put my team in the situation of having that, having them build their hopes up that, Hey, we're working this client. We've got this great, great project. And then two months later, yeah. the client doesn't exist, but also don't want the client spending time and money on something that that ain't going to work for them and i don't want i don't have the time to spend exactly. either so it's like let's let's just let, let's just have a warts and all conversation at the beginning let's look at everything mm-hmm. yeah and we can then either make it work or we can't and if we can't make it work let's let's agree now not mm-hmm. to do it yeah rather than get three months down three three months down you know down uh, three months down the path so you know that's been a that, that's been a very interesting development over the last couple of years as we've kind of gone through that of you know quality over quantity and (laughs) and just you know it's more kind of push people away and if they if they still stick around after you've kind of you know given them the warts and all and showed them everything then you go hey this is going to work yeah and as the the consequence the success rates and the returns we've delivered is just you know multiplied exponentially and also keeps you working with the clients that you want to work with absolutely and it makes it fun yeah, that's exactly right. All right. So one last question before we do rapid fire. Uh, what advice would you give your 20 to 30-year-old self if you could? Believe in yourself more. Oh. Awesome. That's yeah, what I always that, tell that's, people. That's the, the biggest shift with me now compared to me 10 years ago and 15 years ago is 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 that that's level of belief and level of certainty that I don't doubt the path we're on now. I don't doubt whether I can make it where we want to go or not. I, I don't waste any energy mm-hmm. on that anymore. It's just, this is where I am. This is where I need to go. This is what I need to do. Where, you know, previous versions of myself would, would spend countless hours worrying about what happens if you fail. Yeah. <laughs> I do a whole presentation on that. <laughs> uh, you know, and I've been so fortunate in my life to have mentors along the way that believed in me before I believed in myself and kind well, of pushed I've, me. I've, I've probably been fortunate that I've had a couple of catastrophic failures that, you know, I went bankrupt in my early twenties and bankruptcy in Australia is totally different from bankruptcy in the United States where it's, it's really hard to come back from. But then we actually went through financial ruin again when we're making the shift in our business and we lost our house and we lost everything and, mm. and being able to kind of rebuild ourselves through that, through, through that, that now you sit there and go, there's nothing we can't accomplish and there's nothing yeah. we can't do. And, and that, so it's like, that doesn't matter what situation you throw at me now. It's just going, I've been through it. I've done it. And I've come out of the other side stronger and better for it. So, you know, that's, that's been, been my kind of learnings and my mentors has been, you know, really myself and my failures, you know, and being able to kind of build, build back from them. So, you know, now it's that when you're in that kind of level of success, mm-hmm. yeah, you look at it, you, you look at it from a totally different perspective. Yeah. So my first, my first rapid fire question, I think you've already answered hardest lesson learned. <laughs> hardest lesson learned. Um, ooh. <laughs> I've answered a year from the, the financial point of view, but the, probably the hard, the hardest lesson out of all of that is, you know, surround yourself with the right team because oh. if you don't have the right team, yeah, you, 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 you drive yourself off a cliff and no one's going to stop you. Yeah. Very true. And that's something that we need to, <coughs> sorry, I was doing so well. <coughs> you did well. <laughs> Okay. We need to teach our kids that too. All right. Adaptability. Essential. 
We learned that in the last yeah. two years. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, adaptability comes resilience. Exactly. So when was it the most fun? Before you were CEO or becoming CEO? Building oh, it's the most fun. It, it's the most fun now. And, it's, <laughs> awesome. and it just, every, every week just gets more and more fun. So, you know, the, the most fun is probably in five years' time from now and then, then five <laughs> years beyond that and five years beyond that because, yeah, it's just, it's all, yeah, it's all getting better. It's, yeah, it's just fun. I said, I've got great clients. I've got a great team, great systems and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I sort of love every element of what we do. And outside of work, I do my strongman training, which I love as well. So it's just, yeah, t t today, this week was more fun than last week. And next week will be more fun than this week. That's a great attitude. How do you stay focused? Uh, strongman training. Now, I do. I train. I train five days a week, and that's just my time to switch off and just lift heavy stuff and focus on that. And that <laughs> probably probably deals with a bit of that ADD because I'm so fatigued after after training that it's just get in, get it done. Um, but it, yeah, that's the that's the essential part of my day that that keeps keeps everything productive and focused. I can appreciate that. <clears throat> so what are you most grateful for? Uh, whew, there's lots of things. I'm probably the <coughs> most grateful is for is for my family. <laughs> the fact that everything we've been through, my wife and I've been able to work through it. My kids have come through it and and you know have, have used it to become some you know some really amazing young young kids and you know my oldest are starting to get into the young adult phase now so you know that when, when I look at them and the fact of everything that I've been through they still stick with me um, <laughs> is, is is probably the parts that make me most grateful all righty so it is time now for us to share my screen so this is your warning to get out your pens and pencils uh, if you're listening online I will read <clears throat> Matt's, at least his website. So you can contact Matt at going to www.online, that's capital O-N-L-I-N-E, capital T-O, capital O-F-F-L-I-N-E.com dot A-U. So that's www.online to offline.com dot A-U. His other website is www.thesalesgrowthscorecard.com. That's capital T-H-E, capital S-A-L-E-S, capital G-R-O-W-T-H, capital S-C-O-R-E-D. I'm sorry, <laughs> capital S-C-O-R-C-A-R-D, thesalesgrowthscorecard.com. And email is an easy one, Matt at online to offline.com au so again that's matt at online to offline.com dot au he's on linkedin just matthew boyle yeah i think if you just uh, search matthew boyle you'll probably find him but he's 0867051010 that's matthew boyle one t M-A-T-H-E-W dash B-O-Y-L-E dash O-8 six seven O five one zero. Matt, tell them about your gift. So the sales growth scorecard is a tool we put together to really help business owners understand what's possible with with outsourcing with automation and and that. So if you go go to the salesgrowthscorecard.com and answer a few simple questions there, that will give you some really clear insights into what you can start doing today to improve your lead generation, improve your sales, sales conversion, improve your, your, your revenue and start to, to grow that um, predictably, um, as well as starting to lower some of your sales, sales costs. So um, really great insights um, in that and, and more than happy once you've downloaded that to be able to um, offer any, any sort of one-on-one -on -one coaching to be able to sort of just help you understand exactly what what's meaning in the re report there. 
Excellent. And I see I have a typo there, but I will fix that before I put it on the, the website. So it's time for us to say goodbye. I'm so sad. It has been so entertaining and educational. I could probably talk to you for hours, but I want to thank Matt Boyle, our guest today, for sharing his story, some really good tips and some insights as to um, how we can take our social entrepreneurship to that next level. You can learn more by visiting him on LinkedIn or visit his website. Definitely take advantage of that free gift. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to him via email or to his website. So as we end today, I just want to say until next time, remember, life is a journey and it's up to you to enjoy the ride. This is Vicki Nethling signing off. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you for tuning into the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling, where we share impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Remember to visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast.